Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Three Plastic Surgeons and a Microphone. As always, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Dr. Salvatore Pacella in La Jolla, California. He's, you can find him at, at San Diego Plastic Surgeon and Dr. Sam Ree from Paramus, New Jersey at Bergen Cosmetic. And as always, I am Sam Jurikar. Today, we have a very exciting topic where we are, are going to talk about revision rhinoplasty. We've talked about rhinoplasty on a few occasions, but we're going to talk about what rhinoplasty has gone wrong. Before we get into our guest, who you see sitting in the bottom right-hand corner, we're going to just go over our usual laundry list of matters. Sam? Thanks. This show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is for informational purposes only. Treatments and results may vary based on circumstances, situation, and medical judgment after appropriate discussion. Always seek the advice of your surgeon or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding medical care, and never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking advice because of something in this show. Back to you, Sam. So today we're joined by Dr. Yash Avashia, who is known throughout the Dallas community as Dr. Yash. I have been fortunate enough to know Yash for about five years, both during his aesthetic surgery fellowship and as he's very quickly built, built a kind of a booming rhinoplasty practice here in Dallas. Yash makes no secret that his, his passion is rhinoplasty surgery <laughs> and facial aesthetics. And, and he has already sort of built following of revision rhinoplasty. So today we're going to talk about revision rhinoplasty. So welcome to the podcast, y'all. Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate you guys having me on the podcast. It's a huge privilege. Um, really excited about the discussion. Rhinoplasty is a huge headline. I love probably rhinoplasties. And I think revision rhinoplasty is at a like next level in rhinoplasty. It's uh, everything that is about complexity about primary rhinoplasty. I think revision rhinoplasty is even more complex. And I'm excited about the discussion we're going to have today. So what are the reasons why patients come to you saying, I need some, my, you know, I've had my nose done, I'm unhappy with it. What are common scenarios that you see? You know, the most frequent ones, I think, is why they want to come in for a revision rhinoplasty is one is a functional problem. I think people, people can put sometimes a cosmetic deformity, but when you have a functional obstruction, that's a hard stop for a lot of patients. And that's one of the more pro common reasons patients come in for revision rhinoplasty. And the reason I think other than functional would be cosmetic reason. I think it can be either a, a dorsal deformity, a tip deformity, or they just wanted more of what they originally went in to have done. The problem is that rhinoplasties can be done in so many different ways. We have clothes, we have open rhinoplasty. There's a new idea, philosophy in rhinoplasty called the preservation rhinoplasty. And then there's a whole difference between one surgeon and another surgeon. So even though overall the plan is about the same, the end result is always going to be different. And so I feel bad for patients who sometimes may not have what they're looking for after their first rhinoplasty that kind of leads them to seek out a revision rhinoplasty for that matter. So for our listeners, rhinoplasty is substantially more complicated than traditional rhinoplasty. You've, like you said, as a surgeon, you don't necessarily know what the surgeon before you has done. You don't know, you know, you, you, you may have an operative note to refer to, but it's hard to know what you're left with. So when you see someone for a revision rhinoplasty, do you have specific things that you'll always do or things that you'll tell them? We're going to do this open. We're going to do this closed. Like what's your, what's your, what's your tech you know, right. your approach to that? That's a, that's a great point. I think, you know, in the three phases of taking care of a revision line of patient, the first one being the pre-op, the second one being intra-op and the last one being post-op, I probably spend a lot of energy in my pre-op and certain things that I really say to them. First thing I really need to understand is why they're coming in the scene. And I really have to try to redirect that patient from being upset, focusing on the surgeon in the past or surgeons in the past to more or less of their notes. And I th that's, that's a challenge in many cases with revision patients. I always tell the patient that if I don't see it and if I can't deliver what you're looking for, probably not the right surgeon for you. And I think that's really important for revision patients is being very honest. It's almost, it's almost the most important thing in my opinion is being as clear and honest with your patient upfront. And, and I think they appreciate that too. Ultimately, they're looking for the person to do their revision. They've gone to this and do one, two, three times, and they don't want it again. I think a rhino, a rhinoplasty is a 
a tough enough operation experience as a patient one time around. They're doing it again a few times. You don't want it to spit out with them. You want to make sure you can deliver it. So I tell them if I can't see it, if I don't appreciate the difference that I can give you, then I'm not the right surgeon for you. Or more importantly, I'll tell patients sometimes that if I don't think it's a bad enough problem, I'll also tell them that honestly, because I think it's important to hear that from another plastic surgeon. They probably heard it from their first surgeon, which is why they're coming to you. But I think it's important for them to hear that if it's genuinely what you believe and feel. That's one thing I always tell patients. Second thing I always tell patients is I always will do an open approach for your revision line of plastic. One of the more common reasons why I see patients come in for revision is that a closed line of plastic. And I'm, I'm not dogging on closed line of plastic. I think in the right chin, it's a great operation. The only problem with closed rhinoplasty, in my opinion, is you have a really good surgeon to be closed rhinoplasty. Take a, take it, for example, you've got a field goal to win the game and you put a blindfold on. If you've kicked a thousand plus field goals, you'll probably sink it. If you've only done a few, you'll probably miss it. And that's what I think about closed rhinoplasty. There's so many complexities to the nose. The benefit of doing an open approach is you see the anatomy right there and then. And when, when surgeons or prior surgeons have done a closed rhinoplasty, sometimes they're not seeing everything. And you see that when you open the nose the second time around for revision rhinoplasty. And there's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, I think you can reduce the number of revisions needed for a patient if you do an open approach starting off. So that's, that's just my opinion. And I know that's really yeah. commercial, but I told the patients, I'm going to do an open approach for you. So, Vichella, yeah. you do a lot of a lot of revision rhinoplasty. Do you always do open for your revisions as well? hundred percent. All the time. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, what I sometimes tell my patients is think about, I think about the bone and cartilage as a hand and the, the skin is a glove. You know? So if you, if you're borrowing somebody else's gloves and you put them on many times, that doesn't fit. Right. So it's, so you must you have do quit. whatever. That's an opportunity. Perhaps. Is it too long? Is it too long? Sorry. I'm sorry. I, does, I got confused. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. so, We're still so talking about Boston. The skin wants to do what it wants to do. And right. I feel like the challenge many times in closed rhinoplasty is when you're seeing some of these external contact deformities of the skin, the skin has already been trained sort of adapt cartilaginous structure. So one of the most challenging things is if you try to do it closed again, you're going back into the same skin envelopes. You really need structurally at much better support, which brings me to the question. So what role do you see for preoperative imaging, CT scans, et cetera? And I, I found, you know, a lot of times with functional issues, don't get any imaging. I'll oftentimes uncover a big, large simple spur couldn't really identify on the preoperative itself. I'm going to have a follow-up question before. Yeah, sure. So preoperative, I'll only really do is the patients had prior trauma or if there's such a severe deformity that I can palpate with exam. I do an anterior endoscopy with kind of like a spectrum. I don't really do an endoscope exam. Uh, that's the difference between plastic surgery and ENT. So I'm not really visualizing the posterior. For me, for CTs really only will tell me if if they've had chronic infections and whether or not my functional rhinoplasty with the co with the cause combination is really going to treat it or not. But for a revision patient, I rarely will do a CT preoperatively. I do standardized photographs in the office like like most people would, but I don't routinely go to CT in the that. I, 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 you know, I, I tend to use CT quite a bit for a couple of reasons. So in revisional patients, number one, it's a lot of these patients, as you mentioned, Lee, they, they often have functional issues and Sometimes in, in my evaluation, it's very difficult to, to see what the difference of the role of a crooked septum or a nasal spur is compared to large turbinates. And I think right. it's very challenging sometimes from your rhinoscopy to really understand how the, the turbinates are affecting airflow. The second reason is you see a lot of referral patients who may have had an ENT septoplasty. And, you know, as they agree, the septum is is the premier donor for for cartilaginous support that we use, and, and I think the CT helps me quite a bit ahead of time to understand what kind of cartilage I can work with. Because oftentimes, and when when I'm doing the like this, I'm using a call you Miller strut graft, I'm using spreader grafts, I'm using 
or batten graphs, tip graphs, et cetera. So your thoughts on that? No, I think, I think if that's, it, I think ultimately there are some endpoints that we need to get before we operate. And I think that's what you're highlighting is you don't step into the operator without having all the information, all the data points you can really get. And I think understanding how much code you have in the septum is a really big, important thing. Like you said, even a, a ENT based septoplasty, you still see a lot of septum in there, believe it or not, like you probably implied there. And I think it's good to know before you start you know, going after rib or you're ready to getting cadaveric rib grasp for the patients. I, you, CT scanning, I tend to use, I tend to use the anti-rhinoscopy with the light to kind of visualize where the septum was taken. I'll palpate that as well. I, I personally haven't used CTs to actually give me more detail as far as that, because in most, I also, that's the third thing I always tell the patient is I'm going to prepare you for using or getting a graft for your rib. You know, I don't typically go after their autologous rib. I, I tend to always use cadaveric rib grafts, but I always tell them if you're coming in for a secondary or tertiary winter, it is rhinoplasty, prepare yourself for a rib graft because I don't want to do a surgery where I don't have all my tools available to give you the result you're looking for. I want to make this just a little more basic just for a second, because you guys are using a lot of terms that our viewers have no idea what you're talking about. Your butt, Josh, earlier you used the term preservation rhinoplasty. Sal sure. named a, named a bunch of different cartilage graphs that are that are that you would potentially use. I think you both are saying that when you're doing a revision rhinoplasty, so a secondary, tertiary, or tertiary rhinoplasty, there is a need to add structural support to the mouse. A lot of times, what you guys seem to both be thinking is we need to add cartilaginous support to the nose to build the framework back up. Can you just sort of explain to the viewers, either or both of you guys, why that's important and, and what's the rationale behind you? Sure. Hey, I just simplify it. I think we talked about two things, form and function, revision rhinoplasty, right? So function, whether you can breathe properly or not, can you get it properly through your nose? So that's function. And then form, the aesthetics, the shape, the, the appearance. And in my opinion, I think structure precedes function and form more importantly in a revision life class. And that's why really make sure you have the right structure, you know, during your revision right class C report. Now, one of the frameworks or part of the frameworks for a nose is cartilage, the bone and cartilage realistically. There's different types of cartilage. They have the upper lateral cartilage, the lower lateral cartilages. They have different purposes from a functional and a cosmetic perspective, but it's part of the framework for the nose in addition to the bone. And when you do revision, oftentimes that cartilage is not in its atomic position quality. It's been violated from prior surgery. And so you need to use cartilage to kind of support it and restore it. And then that quickly goes to where are you going to get the cartilage from? And I think Sal had mentioned, you know, the septum is definitely the, the largest workhorse for rhinoplasty. And sometimes if you don't have cartilage there, where else do you go? And I think that leads us to what I mentioned before about using rib cartilage, essentially. You know, it's, it's interesting, Yash. You know, I, I really love and enjoy challenging rhinoplasties in clearly the same way. It just kind of opened so we started. It's a <laughs> yes. So it's like, it's a discipline in and of itself. But plastic surgery that is really have to, to kind of jump in full steam and, and be with. A couple right. points. I think, you know, I, for years I was doing rib cartilaginous grafts and, we, you know, a few years ago, there was kind of a push towards using fresh frozen rib cartilage. And, and honestly, I think that's been a game changer. It, it seems to lot differently than, than the patient's inherent rib cartilage. You know, when you, you know, as well as I do, when you harvest rib cartilage and cutting it fine little slits and, and structure it oftentimes can work. Frozen cartilage doesn't necessarily do that. It oftentimes can really stay, stay super, super straight. And so that that has really, I think, been a huge uh, impact, had, has had a huge impact on my practice. Your, your thoughts okay. on that? I totally agree. Um, I think a lot, a lot can be said about it. I think just reducing the donor site morbidity alone is a huge right. benefit to the patient, female or male for that matter. Pain associated with that. And then... You know, if it's a young patient, you're, you're not going to get exactly, like you said, the cartilage that you may want. It may warp over time. It may bend. And then but you're dealing with that secondary 
you know, consequence after spending, you know, 30, 40 minutes, you know, harvesting and preparing a riprap from there. So I think that's a huge benefit. And then time, time, and it's also saved quite a bit in this operation by not having to go after the patient's rib. So I think those two benefits alone is one of the reasons why I always go for fresh frozen aloe graft, essentially. Now, I like the sheet grafts in general. I think it's already cutting T- taken away a step that you're going to have to do anyways. And so mm. you have a nice prepared shape for you and you can kind of, you know, carve that and shape that to whatever use you may want. For patients that need a lot of cartilage, I'll actually get the segment and, and use it in different ways for whatever I need it for. But in most cases, I'm using a sheet allograph. And again, I think that has revolutionized the revision of the I don't think you just have to go after getting a, a autologous rib. Let me ask this. Both you and Sal have a, a real interest in rhinoplasty, but I don't think people really understand if, you, if you're not a plastic surgeon, what it means to do a, a lot of second time operations on a nose or a third time operation on a nose. It's, it's a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, people call themselves rhinoplasty surgeons and they are very allergic to going back into a nose or maybe a third time back into a nose because it's so difficult. You have to be so precise the first time you, you, you open up a nose and you're, and you're opening up that surgical field. And then the second time it takes like 10 times longer to get through all of that scar tissue to get to figure out what's going on. And I can't even imagine, I think maybe I've done like one three time revision or, or on my own or maybe twice because you can't figure out where anything is. It's just an unholy mess in that nose. There's a reason why Michael Jackson's nose looked the way it did, because every time you go in, it just complicates things tenfold. So what made you decide this is something I want to do? I want to sit here for hours and, you know, opening up this nose and trying to figure out what's going on with it. Like what, what made, what made that something that appealed to you? I think uh, it's a great question. Actually, I go to sleep dreaming about writing last week, honestly, but. To be honest, to be frank, it's, it's way more challenging to apply around plastic because of the things you said, you know, you're dealing with, uh, abnormal anatomy at this point. There's a lot of unknowns. I think it's, it's with the primary rhinoplasty, you see the, even knows you examine it, you have a very good understanding of what you're probably going to deal with because there are certain trends in ethnicities and anatomy, like your physical exam, you have a lot of information at your, at your disposal in the preoperative phase. So when you go in the operating room, there's not many surprises. For the most part, in a revision case, I would say that there is a lot of discovery in the actual surgery, and that is not abnormal. That is not wrong to say that. You know, it shouldn't scare the patient, but that's the truth. You got to have all your tools in your toolbox and available when you go in the operating room. I basically do an introp timeout. I elevate the skin, try to get through all the scar tissue, preserve soft tissue on mold, and then you do like a mental timeout and you see what do I have here? What's going on? What was done in the past? It's a lot of like cerebral work that you're doing. You're trying to think of what was done in the past and what does the patient want and what do I need to do to get that patient there? And then what do I able to do that? And so personally, I love that. I love that whole technical and mental challenge. I think a four hour revision rhino is the most mentally exhausting operation that I do, but I love it. It's not physically taxing. You know, if I do like a four hour 360 lipo, I'll probably be physically exhausted from that. If it's a revision, for sure. But a four hour revision rhino, I'm probably not physically exhausted, but I'm mentally exhausted. I, I personally just enjoy it. I think everybody's, everybody gets turned on by different things and that's something that works for me. But I, I think that's a fantastic insight, Yash. It's feeling from the same way. I could literally spend hours picking away at a nose and kind of looking at you know, the structure and understanding what I'm going to use and what I'm not going to use and trying one maneuver, the skin over, seeing how it looks. You know, one of our former professors, Steve Buckman used to say, you know, about, about facelifts, he said, you know, facelifts are a great operation after the first side. When you do, when you do the second side, it's exhausting, right? So it's trying to get everything symmetric. And that's, that's the one thing I love about rhinoplasty. It's this one operation on one, or what, what you one single operations. That's, that's true. Very true. So Yash, I know you have some, some cases that you were going to share with us. And that sure. was going to be a great time. Absolutely. So, you know, I think the big common trend themes that I'm, that I'm, can you guys see this now? Sure. Can. 
Okay. So the more themes that I've seen in my revision of classes are inadequate cultural support, like we talked about, and then not adequate closure of dead space. And so what that kind of leads to is a lot of scar formation. And you know, what's, what's unfortunate about rhinoplasty is you, the pa patient kind of had a perfect operation and then they have a bunch of scar tissue development that has completely blunted their definition and they're unhappy. So this is one of my uh, patients. She had a primary rhinoplasty about two years ago. And what you can appreciate here is as a loss of definition tip. She actually got a hanging cholinella as well. Um, and you can see on the lateral viewpoint and she didn't spot, she found her nose to still be very large. And, and so we know her exam, she actually has a caudal septal deviation. She's got a hanging cholinella. She's got a very bulbous as well. And this just comes to show what scar tissue can actually look like when you open the nose. And this was an example we had. And so what we did for her is really try to restructure her nose, set her tip to give her good tip support. I think that's another a, a huge topic that we can root into to really get more into the nitty gritty and granular details of rhinoplasty. But for what, what she really needed was restructuring, tip board, and then closure of dead space. And so I actually will do something that actually helps tack down the skin in three different areas. And I don't want to get into too much detail. I know we talked about, you know, making it understandable for, for our listeners, but Preservation rhinoplasty is a great philosophy, a newer philosophy in, in rhinoplasty that I personally have started to really like and, and take more and more into my own techniques. It basically says you want to preserve certain anatomy. You have to appreciate the anatomy, preserve it so you can get a long lasting result. And one of the things that they really talk about is preserving ligaments that connect the framework and the skin. And there are two, two two groups of that, that the tangies ligament, which is kind of right up here in the super tip area and then the scroll ligament right out, out here. And what you see oftentimes after a primary rhinoplasty is just this blunting and fullness here. And so what I'll actually do in the revision case is I'll, I'll go through and I'll actually six O uh, vehicles to help tack that down and fold that skin down together. So you get a little bit more definition and prevent this kind of tissue formation. Now, did you add any additional structural support to her triage? I did. So in addition to moving, so she had a, she had a, had a large collagen strut that I had to, and, and I use obviously for her to create a septal extension graph. In my hands, I found that to be a very consistent in setting tip rotation, which is, you know, where your tip falls up or down and then tip projection without adding any fullness to the tip lobule or the collimellar region. And so that was probably the biggest thing that I, for her, in addition to refining dorsum, slightly redoing her ostomies to help kind of give her a little bit more smoothness in the dorsum. How long do you usually wait in between their primary, their first rhinoplasty versus what you do for them? One, so great question. I, I recommend patients waiting the full year. One um, year. One year. I've had patients come in Unfortunately, a week after their first surgery, they're not happy, um, or sometimes at six months. And I, I, I think there's, there's value in having the patient wait one year. I think they start to appreciate their, their nose. And I think they, they tend to forget the trauma, the emotional trauma that they've experienced from that first surgery. And they start kind of creating a slate and they're mentally ready for the revision by plastic. Said, I think there, I think getting a rhinoplasty, whether it be your first, second, or third, hopefully only your first, but you know what I mean, is a big, is a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. It could be a happy roller coaster or it could be an unhappy roller coaster. And I, I think I really want pace to separate the rides. I don't want them to make it one big ride that night. Does that make sense? That way. Yep. Um, this is another example. This patient had two prior rhinoplasties, actually. The first one was a closed. The second was, a, was an open, but only around the tip. Nothing was done to the dorsum. And then she for her third with me, essentially. And I had to piece a lot of this uh, history to understand what had happened. And like I said, one of the things I, re I really enjoy about revision rhinoplasties is understanding what was done in the past. And so... 
I had enough information to understand that the whole bony dorsum was completely active. Actually, it was not rasped, it was not reduced, not in fracture. And that, that's what was done. There was a very thin skin, the tip, actually. And that was probably from a combination of the claws and the revision limited open tip right up. When I opened the nose, and I'm sure if, if any of you have done the revision right up, you've seen this, but the lower lateral cartilages were completely transected. There is absolutely no integrity or, or structure to it. And, and then the, the whole, the mid vault actually was open. So there's communication between the mucosa and the actual nasal framework. I think that led to operative infection and which led to a lot of scar tissue development in this patient because obviously infection is inflammatory and scar tissue develops. After her surgery, I did end up talking to her and, and pieced together that that's exactly what had happened. To her. And so the big thing for her was kind of doing a lot of damage control and closing off that communication, trying to restructure her tip work. Um, again, using a septal and graft to help support her tip. They wanted more definition to her tip. And then in doing the things that we would normally do in a primary rhinoplasty, reducing her bony dorsum, infracturing her nasal bones to get a little bit more narrowing of her upper third. And then obviously in her case, I use, I, I actually use a, like a unilateral spreader graph to help support the mid vault because in my opinion, I felt that because of the prior violation of the mid she needed some sort of integrity support for long-term success for her. Do you use digital? Yeah. Awesome. Do you use digital simulation with your patients in your consultations? I do. So in addition to these standardized photographs, I actually will use a software and I sit down and do it myself. And I actually kind of morph those to what I understand the patient wants. And it's actually a great exercise the end for the patient, because for me, I am doing more than I probably would do in the operating room. And I know how far I can put and what I can deliver. And I give a back to the patient and the patient this is obviously not the same day of the consultation, but the patient normally will thumb thumbs down or they'll give me their, their feedback saying, you know, I liked it, but I was hoping for a little bit more slope or a more tip projection. I don't want my tip to go up that high. And then you get into this conversation about what I can deliver, what I can't deliver, what's realistic, what's not realistic. I think that's really important in a revision patient. Um, and sometimes I'll tell the patient, I just don't think this, a, a, this is, I don't think what they're asking for is something we can provide them. And in some cases they're like, I'm okay, but at least I had this conversation. Like I said before, I think with revision patients, a lot of it's about the preoperative discussion that you have with them. You don't want to have a moment in the post-op where you and them are saying, oh, oh, we never talked about this, or I wish I had said this to you before. Looks like you have one more case for us, guys. Yeah. Do, do we have time for one more case? We need one more. Okay. Yeah. So this one is a great example of where closed rhinoplasty was done about 10 years ago, and she just didn't have any tip support. And so what is happening was without proper structure. The form was deformed over the course of the years. And so you can imagine her tip, her soft tissue just contracted and pulled her tip up. And she came to me saying that I feel like I look like a pig. I feel like I can see way too my nostrils. And, and, and she had, she, I mean, that is something that I definitely saw. So it makes sense. She had weakness at her soft triangles. And that just comes from lack of support, lack of structure, not able to hold the form that she wanted. And so in her case, again, we did an open approach right up the, and I had to, I ended up, again, my workforce was the septal extension graft. In addition to other things we had to do for her to help restore her Joseph's life and kind of set the tip to where we want it to be. So she has that definition. She has that rotation and hey, she needed a little bit of projection as well. She had prior Taylor flare reductions that were visible. And so we. We attempted to revise that so it's a little bit more, less, distinct, less noticeable where I kind of leave the scars. And, you know, she's about two years post-op and she has pleased with the result. But I think the most important thing is her able to bring her tip down, bring it out a little bit, and then kind of have more of a profile view. And she felt she didn't have that. Yeah. 
Well, you've done a really nice job with there with her taking someone who looked very operated on to someone who looked much more. Nice. So, thank you. thank you so much, Josh, for that discussion. I think hopefully the viewers have an idea uh, of just how much more complicated secondary rhinoplasty is than primary rhinoplasty, which is in and of itself pretty complicated. You, you, you know, and I think this underlying theme amongst all your cases is into the underlying form, the underlying structure, and you can oftentimes give patients the effect they want. So thank you so much for, for your time and taking us down that journey. Do you guys have anything else you want to add? I think it's just amazing that the one of the key points is just, you know, the preoperative melding of minds between you and the patient and making sure that you guys are on the same page and that you can achieve the results that both of you want. And that's that it seems like is so important for all plastic surgeons for any procedure, but particularly in a revision rhinoplasty case. Well, thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Sure.